Shall we pray together? Let's pray. Beloved and everlasting Father, today's service is emotional for me. I ask, Lord Jesus, as we hear these heartfelt stories from our leaders, that you would, by your grace, allow that we have such a discussion this morning, this afternoon as we continue to have, that you would help us to be able to live up to your really high standard, going by the grace that you have set to us. And I pray that our Father, for each and every one of us, there would be such a sense of connection today as we look deep into your word, as we look at one another, as we look at the standards for leadership, as we have a discourse from First Timothy, that by the end of this service, there would be an opening of our eyes in terms of helping us to understand the pressure that your leaders are put under, not just church, but political and otherwise, that we would as a nation rise to the standard you set for us. Indeed, we desire a better nation. We desire a better church. We desire a better citizenry and better congregations, but allow that we'd be able to talk and understand each other so the outcome may be something of what you desire for all of us, for the glory and praise of your own name. We ask now that you would speak over your word, that we would understand it and apply it for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. Let's appreciate Pastor Nico's uh, confession again. Um, I was told that Nico is in the service. Nico, are you here? Is Nico here? Thank you, Nico. Nico is right there. Nico, thank you. Uh, and God bless you for, for your courage, for speaking to us. Do we forgive Nico? Yes. Nico, we forgive you and we love you, my brother. God bless you. God bless you so much. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Edward Ondachi. I am from Mavuno Church, Lavington. I bring you greetings from my boss, Pastor Muraydi Wanjau and the entire executive team from there. We are your daughter church that you planted 15, 16 years ago, and I bring you greetings from there. Thank you very much, Reverend Nick, for the platform that you give us to be able to address these very interesting topics. And today, as we come to the topic of leadership, we come to the intrigues of these corridors. That as we hear from uh, our panelists, Nerima, Sakaja, and Udwak, thank you guys so much. For, wasn't that a lively discussion? Yeah, thank you. That was absolutely beautiful. I wish that we had continued the politics. You know me, I really love this stuff. I wanted to ask Sakaja, how come you hang out with my DVD these days? You used to be a Nairobi guy. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we felt it necessary to, to sort of, you know, people have been asking me, um, and I don't know, you're sitting there, and you probably have some church wounds. People have told me, Ondachi, you and your colleagues have hurt us. Before you start to address issues of politicians, clean your own house first. A friend of mine many years ago was being counseled by a pastor, actually a friend of mine, and the counseling was taking a bit long. And the issues didn't seem to be going away. So this friend of mine was coming against the same issue like the 16th time. And the pastor was getting a little tired, but it was difficult to explain because counseling can be very tiring. Uh, and he decided to call the pastor from his phone, but the call was going to a landline in the office. And so he brought up the same issue again, and the pastor was very gracious, but he was sitting in an open plan office, and the phone was on speaker. And as this person was sharing again, the pastor was talking to him and, 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 and encouraging him, you know, to, to just be patient with his problem. And then they, they made a next appointment. But before my friend hung up, uh, when the call was over, he had someone in that office asking the pastor, who is that? And in the few seconds before he clicked the phone to close it, he had the conversation. And the pastor says, this is that other problem guy, man. I don't know where he's coming from. I mean, this guy just won't quit. 
and then the phone went dead. And that brief, that brief conversation, he nearly committed suicide. He felt that God had given up on him. He felt that it's over. He felt if the pastor can say that about me, if he can talk to his colleagues like that about me, if he can pretend that he's listening to me and he's not, he never went to see that pastor again. How many of you have been wounded by a pastor or a church? Can I see your hand, please? Just be honest, it's fine. I'm not taking noisemakers and I will not report you. There are a lot of you who are actually here today because a pastor did something to you. And these are the things which are being asked to sort out first because this is leadership. And Paul addresses it very clearly in this book about the standards for which we pick our leaders. And I'm standing here today to offer you a very sincere apology for that. I know that I have hurt people. In our job, the complexities of what it is when we have to relieve you of your job, when we lose our temper, when we leave this pulpit, and in these 20 minutes, you cannot see all my faults in 20 minutes. But in that time when we're dealing with Nico and serving six years, we get to the point where that confusion really exists. Some of you pastors have insulted you. Some of you have been chased away from the churches where you served as a volunteer for many years. Some of you have been gossiped about. Some of you signed up in a pyramid scheme where the pastor was at the top. <laughs> and after he had made his money, he said, away with you. Or he said, that, that scheme collapsed. Are you there? From that laugh, I'm saying maybe that's why you even came here. <laughs> Some of you have been insulted and therefore you felt like God has cast you. Some of you even came from churches where they actually curse you when you leave. Some of you have been fired unfairly and maybe you've been told that there's nowhere where you can take the church. I've been told that Pastor Ondachi, you have no idea how difficult it is to confront a pastor. You've been here for so long, you don't know that to come against a pastor is like you feel like you're coming against God. Someone even told me that you can't get a pastor to confess because pastors protect pastors. I've been told that. One time somebody called me and they told me, Pastor Ondachi, I forgive you. <laughs> and I've not seen them in like five years. And they went ahead to highlight all the things which I had done against him. We were working together, and so a time came when I had to, to, to release him to the wider ministry. That's the polite time we use in church for firing you. <laughs> and he was very hurt, very, very hurt. Typically, when a pastor does something against you, the first person you take it out on is actually God. It's the closest victim that you feel. So you stop coming to church completely. You stop praying. You stop it completely. But the greatest outtake is you stop giving and stop tithing. So sometimes we sense that you're here, but your uptake is very low. And so we sense that maybe you feel you should go to church, but you're taking it out on God. Then there are those of you who decide you, 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 the second result is that you end up living in pain and suspicion. And so if Pastor Nick or Kabibi or Reverend Liz ask you to volunteer for something, you just don't. You say, look, I, I have burned myself out trying to serve your people. So now I will just come and sit and be quiet and do nothing. There's a lot of members of our congregation who do that. Some of you decide to let go and let loose. Now God is going to see what I can do. It's license now to, to, to be wild. And you actually self-harm yourself. And I've met many people in very bad situations because of that. Someone told me they are going to test, we have been fired by a church, so they said, I'm going to test beer from every county <laughs> in Kenya. Because a church had fired him. Some of you have the fear of trusting any pastor, any 
I've met people, we're having a very good conversation, it's a good family setting, people are being introduced, and then I'm introduced as a pastor. And then they say, you people. <laughs> you people are all the same. But the most common one is you just have a strange and consistent anger that won't go away. It's just consistently there. I would like to tell you that if a pastor hurt you, it's not God who hurt you. Please don't take it out on God and therefore on yourself. Because going against God is significantly personally harmful to you. You are hurt by a servant of God who is not God and who has many faults. And so I would like to ask that you kindly, kindly forgive us. But the standoff that you continue to have, the refusing to volunteer that you have, the testing beer from any county, it just harms you. So please don't do that. I want to plead with you to please don't do that. Reconcile with God and kindly forgive us because we are people who fall and do continue to fall. Our sermon for today is entitled The Dilemma of Church Leadership. There are three things which we feel is important for you to understand. If at the end of this sermon you, you can say, I think I know how I can pray for my pastors, I'll have succeeded in this mission. Because we feel that sometimes there is a standoff. We don't like the suspicion. Sometimes we try to ask you to volunteer for something and you don't want to do it. Because a pastor ran away with your money. A pastor did things to you, and sometimes they are such deep things that are difficult to explain. I hope that today's sermon is coming as an explanation. The first sermon we did here came through as a confession. Last Sunday it came through as a challenge. Today, I'm hoping to be able to explain something to you. But by that explanation, I'll also be explaining your faith, if you're a born-again Christian, and how the world understands it. It's the same thing. It's actually the same thing. There is a dilemma that we carry that is very mysterious because who can serve God? That's a very serious dilemma. It's a very, very big dilemma. Some people have asked you in your office, who are you? Are you now assistant God, you? Haven't people asked you that? Who, who do you think you are to be the one to lead us here in prayers? People ask you that. And today I'm hoping to be able to explain to you the leadership conundrum that pastors in particular go through because some of these things, going by the way you see us, the pain is terrible because of the vulnerability that you have when you come to us. And we do sin, and we fall, we do, and we hurt you very deeply. And so I'm asking that kindly forgive us for what we've done. It is not God who did it to you, it was an imperfect vessel in God's hand that did it to you. And so I'd like to explain to you these things as they are coming from 2 Timothy. There are three very short points. But uh, we've already given the background to the book of Timothy. Timothy was a young man, 36 to 38 years old. He was left at Ephesus where Paul had planted a church. And Paul was giving him various things to do with this church where he had left him. There were issues about women that came up. We talked about it week one. There were issues about youth, which he was telling him, don't let anyone look down on you. But then in this Five, chapter 3, Paul was telling him, how do you elect leaders? And leaders stand for people like deacons, pastors, elders, people who like work for you, other pastors. What category do you use to choose them? That was important. Don't just pick anyone who walks up to you who says, you know, I would like to volunteer. Don't pick a kleptomaniac, someone who's been recently released from prison for theft as treasurer. Don't do that. So, there were standards which he set. But the standards which Paul set in 1 Timothy for leaders, any person who wants to lead in the church, were 15 qualities and two death sentences that he gave him. Serious stuff. And I want to read that out to you, and then we check on the dilemma that these verses then present to us. So Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 3 to 7, and I read, Paul tells him, Timothy, Whoever aspires to be an overseer seeks a noble task. Like if, and aspire doesn't mean that they have an ambition. It means they sense inside a desire to serve. He said that's not a bad thing. But remember that you are occupying 
that thought that has driven that, you are asking something of great nobility. Great nobility. So he tells him 15 qualities that person must have. Number one, he said that person must be above reproach. Just think about it. Number two, faithful to their wife. Number three, temperate. Number four, self-controlled. Number five, respectable. Number six, hospitable. Number seven, able to teach. Number eight, not given to drunkardness. Number nine, not violent but gentle. Ten, not quarrelsome. Eleven, not a lover of money. Twelve, he must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him. And he must do so in a manner worthy of respect. Also, he must not be a recent convert. Paul says, if someone can't manage their own family, how do you expect them to know how to run a church? Then he must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited, and here is death sentence number one. He may fall under the same judgment as the devil. Do you know what judgment the devil is going to fall under? It's eternal damnation. And then he must have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall, number two, death sentence, uh, into disgrace and into the devil's trap. That is the standard Paul set. So if we set this as a standard of people who should serve, tell me who is supposed to apply for this job. <laughs> and you see, God's standards are not going to change. They are the same. So the first dilemma of church leadership is in order to qualify you must be unqualified in order to qualify you must be completely unqualified what does this have to do with the fact that you're a born again christian you couldn't save yourself no matter how much you wanted in order to be a christian you must be unable to save yourself so even though you say i'm saved it wasn't the kind of thing you aspired to be. God had to save you. For servants of God, for ministers of God, the qualification is for you to say, I don't want that job. I cannot do it. I remember being approached by Bishop Oscar of this church, and we were talking about ministry, and he told me on that year, I would like you to come to Nairobi Chapel. And when he, when he listed out what I'm supposed to do, I told him, Bishop, I can't do it. And he said that you refuse probably means you should do it. And he told me wherever he goes and is looking for pastors to plant our many churches, he said, I don't look for somebody who wants to do it. I look for somebody who admits they cannot do it. It is something inside our hearts that we need to be able to agree with God that nobody can do God's work to qualify. Nobody can. And let me tell you, this presents confusion inside of us. It presents a lot of confusion. Each of us sit here in these fancy outfits, trembling inside. It's a reality we live with each and every day. Some people have called it uh, an, a, an internal inconsistency or imposter syndrome. Some people, some people call it that. But it's hard to understand who is worthy to do the work of God. Once upon a time, James and John, the disciples of Jesus, went to Jesus, uh, to Jesus and their mother told Jesus, you are talking of these lofty things about your coming kingdom. Permit that my sons, James and John, one will sit at your right and the other at your left in your coming kingdom. I, I want to ask this favor of you. And then Jesus called everybody together and he compared two leadership styles, one belonging to the world and another one, the kingdom of God. And he told them, John, Matthew chapter 20, 24 to 28, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles, Jesus said, lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. That's how the world operates. But he told them, not so with you. Not so with you. Instead, Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. 
Many, many pastors run away from this job. They didn't want to do it. I know very few pastors who said, ever since I was small, I've always wanted to do this job. They were doing something else, and then God interrupts their life. That's how it is. And God does it amazingly. So a person who is shy, makaratasi like me, 20-something years ago, who was running away from God, today I can be standing and preaching to great people like yourself. It wasn't because I wanted it. It's because everything you see is a work of God. Everything. My sister is here, she can testify of my issues growing up. And my wife is here, she can testify of my issues. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. This job, it's complex. Because it is a dilemma. To qualify, you must be unqualified. Haven't you ever asked yourself, there are people in your office you work with. There are people you see every day. They are not here. You know someone even told me, this time I'm saved. It sounds very arrogant. You are saved from what? Are you better than us? You know you are saved by God's grace. He just picked you. The truth is in a big crowd, God could have done icky, pinky, ponky, father had a donkey, and then it landed on you and says, I'm going to save this one and not this one. And you can't explain it. You really can't explain it. It's the mystery of God. And it's challenging. By the time you get to pastors, it's just more intense. It's more intense. That's the first dilemma of leadership. The second dilemma of church leadership is, though we are human, we actually appear perfect. And that's why I talked about the dilemma of the stage and the dilemma of what we are called to do. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 1 to 4, this is the humanness of the people that are picked. And this would be how a pope is selected. This is the high priest who is picked by God. The most holy man on the land, this is how he was picked. Hebrews 5, verse 1 says, every high priest is selected from among people, ordinary people, and is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. Verse 2, this is important. He is able to, lead to, to, to deal with you gently, those who are ignorant and are going astray. Why? Because he himself is subject to weakness. That's why he's picked. That is why he's able to offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as for the sins of the people. And no one takes this honor on himself. He must be called by God just as Aaron was. This is the high priest. This is the pope, the holiest man on the land. He must approach God's throne on your behalf carrying sacrifices for his own sins. And he has to deal with his own sins first before he presents yours. So let me illustrate shortly. When the high priest went to God, he went with a bowl of sins. First of all, he needed to dress up. Kind of like the way I'm dressed up. When I was ordained here, we were given these vestments to be able to wear. And they're a little more elaborate than this. And each vestment has a symbolism. So that when you approach God's throne... God sees the outer casing and can overlook your inner person. That was actually the purpose. You are covered. And right now we are covered by the righteousness of Christ. So God doesn't take you on your own merit. But when the high priest went to God dressed up, he went with a bowl of sins trembling. Because should God's light penetrate into that outfit, he's dead. But he came in not just representing himself, he came in representing you and everything that you are carrying and he is trembling. Inside, he knows his own hypocrisy. Inside, he knows his own problem. But guess what? He's covered and he's coming before a holy God. So to God, he is vile and messed up because God's eyes cannot look at evil. So he's aware of it and he's carrying your sins. So from how God looks at him and how God knows the truth because look, the outfits don't fool God. We, we know that. So God knows that I am actually looking at sin. And God chooses to forgive sin. And that is his posture when he's going to God's presence. 
The same person dressed like this, when he leaves God's presence and he now comes to face you, he is glowing with God's glory. That's how Moses was <laughs> when he came from the mountain. His face was glowing. People were telling him, oh, please don't approach us because you're glowing with God. So in a way, in order for me to communicate to you the word of God, which is the word of God, I have to appear as if I am just him. I have to appear as if I'm perfect because I'm not communicating to you my personal opinions. This is the word of God, which is perfect. So in your eyes, you would be seeing someone who when they are speaking on God's behalf, they are elevated. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Because the outfits also say something about it. The high priest was supposed to look a certain way. He was supposed to bathe a certain way. He was supposed to smell a certain way. And the perfume he wore, you could not repeat it. So that when he's ministering to you, you have a sense that God is touching you. And that's what happens when we pray for you. It is that contact that raises your faith to God's glory and then you're healed. But friends, we are aware that the clothes are not us. We are aware of it. We are representing God. And it's the same for you wherever you go. When people ask you about your arrogance, what makes you think that in this family you're the only one who can pray? And yet you see yourself and they try, they try to cut you down. They try to criticize you. You try to witness someone, tell them about Jesus, and they're cutting you down because they're wondering, now you, what are you saying? But some of you have had the privilege to lead others to, their, to the saving faith of Jesus. Am I right or not? It's how the kingdom of God expands because they have to see you as a contact point for God. It's how it works. But inside... <laughs> there's a lot of mix. You are not, you are human, but at certain points for God's work to happen, at that point, you appear perfect. And this is a pain point for many people, like the phone call I'm telling you about. At that point when my friend was talking to this pastor, he was talking to God. And then he hears someone who's God's representative saying, who is this guy? And it's very, very painful. Dilemma number three, the dilemma of church leadership, is that though we work hard, we must resist glory. We, for, for you to continue, you must resist glory. There is something very attractive about power and human beings. It's amazingly seductive. And God is very jealous for his name. And for what he does. Very jealous. And that is a significant point in our dealing with God. You cannot steal God's credit. And a lot of times people find themselves there. People throw themselves at you. People believe everything you're saying. It's very powerful when people do what you're saying because of what you do. But every day, many pastors will tell you, their hardest day is Monday. It's Monday. You are off the pulpit. You are not preaching. You are all alone. Nobody can understand the confusion you are going through. There you are yesterday, ministering to a lot of people. There are many pastors in hospital with back problems and depression sometimes. Because you have to divest yourself of everything that was not you. You represented a holy and powerful God. I don't understand how one person, um, one person from Ishirinjiri Market, one, can be standing here and you're speaking and somehow the word is being understood by everyone. You can be seduced into thinking that was you. And people come up to you and they tell you, man, that was amazing. And inside you may be saying glory to God, but you're saying, yeah, that was me. You, you can get very confused about it. So in the Old Testament, this is how God said you do it. The law of the burnt offering worked like this. It's in Leviticus chapter 6. There were many offerings that the priest was supposed to give uh, to God. But the burnt offering represented service. And it was a whole animal that was slaughtered whole until it burnt to ashes. And the high priest would watch it burning for the whole night. 
and it would burn and burn and burn as he watches it. And try and imagine the mental image that was going through his mind as he's watching how God sees service. That was your whole life given to God. Now the instructions in the Bible are like this. It was the law of the burnt offering. He said, watch it burn. In your official clothes, watch it burn. After it has burned to ashes, the clothes of the high priest included an, an inside garment made of cotton that went from here up to your feet. And God said, make sure that the ashes from the burnt offering never touch your body. If you've ever lit a fire and it went to ashes and, and, and fire went on your, and the, the, the ashes went on your skin, do you, do you know how difficult it is to remove it? It attaches, actually ashes are attached to, attracted to your body. God said, make sure it doesn't touch your body. There's a reason. And after you wear that linen garment, pack the ashes, put them aside, and then wear normal clothes. This is in the Bible, Leviticus 6 verse 8, going forward, you can read it. And then he says, in your normal clothes, take the ashes, go outside the camp, and throw it at a place that is ceremonially clean, and then in your normal clothes, come back to the camp. After you have preached to many people, after you have prayed and people have been saved, after you have gone for missions and people have been transformed, after you have prayed and somebody was raised from the dead, people have been healed and everything else, pack all that and throw it away. Make sure it doesn't attach itself to your skin because you know what? It wasn't you. If ash attaches itself to your skin, you go around people and you know, when ash attaches itself to your skin, you need bodyguards. You'll get it tomorrow. <laughs> because everybody's clamoring after you. They're saying, oh my goodness, what you did the other week, you know people are crowding you. Me and understand if you want to crowd you, sucks, that's fine. You, you're a politician. You're... But here, my goodness, people can crowd you like you're a celebrity. But you know why, why that would happen? is because you've accepted the glory. You've accepted the glory. It's now you. You know when you do such a good job for God, people should crowd God, not you. They should go to God. And they will feel God did that for me. And that's awesome. And it's clear because you're not desiring that glory. And God was very specific about the burnt offering. It was an instruction to the priest. But I'll tell you something. Your pastors are human. They often need encouragement. Monday is very difficult for your pastors. It's hard. You feel alone. You feel depressed. You feel, I, I don't even know. Maybe, Nick, you have other words that you can explain. I know you, you go riding on your bike. You go out of town. There are many things people do, but it's a very lonely space for pastors. And I'm saying it's a dilemma because you don't know what to do with it. It's a big struggle. In fact, you are more tempted to steal that glory just for some esteem sometimes. But my feel is that many, many congregations don't understand that struggle. And so even for Nico, with his travel, with his A, B, C, D, he must have had his down moments that are very vulnerable. And let me tell you, we have a devil who doesn't sleep. We have a devil who doesn't care about your call. And he will take advantage of your lonely moments and bring you down to his own credit. He will do that. Just lay your hands on that person who need to pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we want to pray for this person. Kindly give them peace in the name of Jesus. I pray peace over you in Jesus' name. Peace at this moment. Peace. Peace in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Glory is a thing of the heart. And when you're taking God's glory, it doesn't matter what you say. It matters what your heart is feeling. That is what matters. The moment I leave this stage, the moment Reverend Kabibi leaves this stage, the Reverend Reverend Nick leaves this stage. We become very, very ordinary men and women. Our pastors are going to minister to that lady, so please don't worry about it. The Lord is in control. Amen? Amen. Amen. 
So I need us to understand three things. Number one, the pastors who are called by God to you are unqualified. The pastors who God calls to you appear perfect, but they are not perfect. The pastors who God calls to you battle with glory. We do. But the same is the case for you. And so today as we close this service, we would like you to be able to pray for your pastors. I'm waiting for her to leave so that you concentrate back to me. Is that all right? <laughs> okay. My last point is, I said that if we finish this sermon and you feel that you know how to pray for your pastors, we will then have succeeded in this mission. And so today I want to ask you to kindly remember that we are unqualified. Though we are called and we are not complaining about it, but we want you to understand that it's difficult. Reverend Liz, if you'd please join me here because we want to close the service now. We are unqualified, we appear perfect, and we battle glory. So please, please pray for us as we minister to you here Sunday in and Sunday out and do work like that. Tomorrow becomes very difficult for us. So as we close this service today, ordinarily, we would have prayed for you. We want to ask you today if you would pray for us. Is that okay? Yeah. Reverend Liz and I represent all the people who minister to you. We represent people who have hurt you. We represent people who in their fallenness have done things they should not have done to you. So I'm kindly asking that you stand to your feet and pray for us. And then we're going to invite Professor Lewa to come up and then pray for us. Liz and I are going to kneel down and kindly raise a prayer to God on our behalf because of the work that we do. Thank you. Father, in Jesus' name, I come before you, Lord, to repent of my own transgressions and those of my family, those of my children and grandchildren. And we repent as a church, Lord. May you forgive us, Lord, because we are always falling short of your glory. Mm. In our interactions with the friends, with our pastors, with the church ministers, we pray that, Lord, you forgive us. We know you are faithful to forgive us when we repent. And now, Lord, we pray for the church ministers, all those people in this church, who are in position of leadership. Thank you, Lord, because you have given us wonderful men and women to serve us, to prepare us for eternity. They have chosen a noble job, and we pray that, Lord, you strengthen them. We pray that you forgive them for their weaknesses, because they are human. You forgive them for are not even reaching the bar as you would expect them to. Father, we pray that the leaders, the church leaders, are going to be encouraged. They are not going to give up. They will continue to be strengthened by you, O oh Lord. We know they are facing a lot of pressure, politically speaking, a lot of pressure from the economic dimension, social cultural pressures. Father, we pray that you strengthen them. You continue to support them because that is your vow. Mm. That will always be supporting them. I pray for the congregation, Lord, that we are going to rise up to the challenge of supporting our church ministers. Because they need our support in word, in kind, in prayer, and many, in many other ways. As we come to the end of the year, Lord, and begin a new year, we pray that there will be a change in the way we interact with our church ministers. Realizing that they are as human as we are, and that they need your grace. Father, increase grace in us, so that we can be able to do a better job in supporting our church ministers. 
Titus 2.11 says, You have given each and every one of us grace. Lord, we pray that we extend this grace to the wonderful men and women who have chosen, or rather you have chosen, for this noble job of preparing us for eternity. We pray that, Lord, we may be a different congregation in terms of what is going to be happening, and in particular in terms of our interaction with our church ministers. Mm. Put the recognition in all of us that we are all human, and we have fallen short of your glory, and our pastors are, 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 and other leaders are no exception. We know we are living in very, very turbulent times, when they are changing paradigms in terms of theology, in terms of philosophies that are confusing your church. But you have these men and women whom you have chosen to serve you. May you, Lord, support them. And may you help us to also play our part. Your word in Isaiah 65, 24 says, before we ask you give, and before everything else, before speaking, you have heard. And we believe that, Lord, you have heard our prayer that we are going to have a new dispensation in terms of how we support the pastors, the leaders, in terms of how we handle them, in terms of how we protect their dignity. Father, help us. We thank you, Lord. And in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, I pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me help you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. God bless you as you go. We will see you next week. Asante Nisan.